This episode is sponsored by our friends at Dukan. Launch your online store in 30 seconds. No coding or design skills required. Whether you are a small business trying to go online, a teacher looking to set up digital presence, or you just want to sell a goat, Dukan is your one-stop solution. At the start of the pandemic, when small businesses were struggling, Dukan helped over a million merchants move from offline to online. Founder of Dukan is also Billion Moonshots alumni. He shared his story of making $25,000 per month in college to now building a $100 million startup. So start your 14-day free trial now at mydukan.io. You started from selling TVs to shipping one product every two weeks for four months last year, I guess. And now you have built out this entire massive platform tweet hunter where you're helping people to grow and you have the craziest the biggest twitter people over there like sahil bloom uh i've seen adit over there a lot of cool people over there but let's start from let's start from where you began let's start from your first internship where you were selling tvs how was that yeah so i just i was thinking that uh like the real work um uh, on the field uh being t- talking with people was something that you can really learn from Hmm. And um, I did like uh, I think just by selling something very typical like TVs, you can learn the basics about how people work, what they really want, and that the the real the real thing, the most important thing is truly listening to them, and not only trying to push what you have to sell. Right. Do you have a cool story about selling TV to someone? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think my I was so happy about doing my best sell ever. Like I think it was a the the. The most expensive TV we had, like a three thousand uh, dollars with the extended guarantees, and like a- anything you can sell, I did it, and uh, I was so happy about it. And the guy just came back three days after. It was a total mess because it was not the right one for him. Uh, it was not the right uh, way to fix it on the wall, and it, like it was a big failure for me. So I was, <laughs> I had this little uh, spike of happiness, and then uh, I was miserable. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I guess that's really important sales, right? Like the what do we call it? The post sales uh recovery or sort of like where you also yeah. need to make sure that hey selling is not it like you also need to make sure that customer is happy after buying it because only then they're going to come back to you again exactly. maybe in one year or two years yeah. so if you treat the clients uh it will cost you more uh after hmm. right totally that makes sense uh now let's get back let's get to like fast forward to when you launched the pistache app is that how, is that how you pronounce it pistache um it's it's a french name so for me it's pistache does pistachio mean pistachio in English? Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was my first startup. Pretty, pretty exciting. I thought that was super cool because I was trying to do something similar and living with like while I was back in India, I'm, I grew up in India. So while I was back in India, I was basically like, you know, trying to think more about that because I was living with my 11 year old little sister and I can see that, yeah, if you give the right incentives, they will do the right work. So how do you uh, systemize these incentives or these incentive structures? So I thought that was really cool. Can you explain like what was the idea and what happened at the end? You worked on it for like three to four years, right? Yeah, exactly. So basically, we, we wanted to work on motivation, and we loved these ideas of uh, gamifying app and uh, and pushing you to do something that's important for you, but uh, through gaming and rewards. And um, we met parents, and they mm. all said the same thing: we want this for our kids. So we just we built it. We it, it was a game at the very beginning, and we added like a ways to for parents to communicate about, hey. Uh, can you just brush your teeth, clean up your room, or do all those things that are important to you? And and you will get like uh, access to this game or uh, you'll be able to watch this, et cetera. Uh, it worked quite okay. It was not huge success and not huge failures, but uh, I realized now how there's so many things that I didn't do correctly. And I think that was basically because I was not a parent at the time. Hmm. Right. What, if you want to point that out, what was something that you didn't do correctly? Yeah, so it's like everything related to UX. Uh, basically, you you think you think about um, like on paper, it seems very easy. Kids do the chores. Uh, he will tell it on the app, and then the parents will just uh, say, "Okay, it's done." The thing is, as a first app, it's so complicated to do. Basically, you have two users, the kid and the parents. Uh, you have to make them both happy, and they have very different uh, aspirations. And hmm. when you are building an app and you have only one user, it's, it's still very, very hard to truly understand what the users want. And here in this case, we had two users and it was our first app. So I think it was pretty obvious that we were just uh, 
fading in some ways. Right, right. From a product perspective, what do you think could be done better? Just from the product um, that the idea. So the, the problem is like the the gamified parts um, is competing against every other application on the parent's phone. So uh, you have two two ways. Uh, you have I think you have two choices. You can just do the best game ever, and and you you need to get the kids to really want to play your games. So they will want they will want it as a reward and not the other games uh, which will mm-hmm. be on the phone. And that's super hard because basically you are competing against everyone in the world including like Candy Crush or Clash of Clans uh, or you would have to like uh, take over on the system and block the access with the other applications if uh, the chores are not done and that's something that could be done on Android but not on an iPhone or like iOS system so the problem I think is that we didn't really choose and we were in between and when you are in between it's generally bad that makes sense. You don't only have to have a really good game like Candy Crush, really addictive game that people would want to play, that kids would want to play, but you also want to then layer this sort of permissions on top of it that, okay, if this happens only, then you get access. Yeah. Uh, like this problem still is out there. Still a lot of parents are trying to figure this out, especially I think in Western countries where uh, parents do not spend a lot of time with kids because they are like both the parents are in a full-time job and kids are at home. So like if you had, do you think this could be like, if you had to do this again, how would the structure be? How would well, the idea be? Maybe, maybe something important to say first is that when you have a problem that is obvious and it's yeah. still here and it's not solved, I think it's usually not a good thing for startups. It means that of course, like everyone who tried to fix it fails. They fail. So yeah. be careful. If you, if you want to try to fix it, uh, make sure that you have something that people before didn't have. Hmm. Or, or you will think that you can do it, but you will fail because you didn't, you didn't um, see what will be the the problems yet. That's interesting to think about. That if there's a problem that still exists out there for a long time and yeah. it hasn't been solved, which means it's a hard problem. Stay away from it. Exactly, and and very <laughs> often, like it's 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 very interesting this because um, the the most of the problems we see, hmm. they are they are really the wrong problem to solve. Because most of them, they, they get in this category of problem that has already existed and they are still here because they are super hard to solve. That makes sense. Is there any other problem that you can think of that has been out for a long time? Yeah, so something something really interesting is like um, trying to push people to go outside more. Hmm. It's so we, we are, this is the pitch basically like a, um, we are all hooked to our phones and computers and I will build an app that will uh, motivate you to get out and meet new people and meet strangers that will uh, help you learn about new things. And on paper, it seems awesome. And I heard this pitch like um, hundreds of times and because it's like, it's very easy to come up with this. But the problem here is that it's something that people um, should do, but they do not want to do it. So everything that is about what they should do is usually a very wrong approach, in my opinion. Right, right. So last year, I was building a dating app and I was reading a lot about it. I was looking at views of other entrepreneurs who have a lot of experience, whom a lot of founders have already pitched dating apps and how they think about it. So one founder was like, you know why Tinder works? Because Tinder makes people more lazy. You just lay on your bed and you keep on swiping. Yeah. If you have a lot of friction in your app that, okay, you have to chat first, then you have to meet first, then something's going to happen, stuff like that. That's a lot of friction. People hate it. And yeah, you will find a niche community, but it's it's not going to grow because it is hard. Uh, yeah. It is hard work when you compare that to simple swiping right and left on Tinder. So I thought that was very interesting. Like he's basically saying that if you can build an app that makes people more lazy, you can find a lot of growth. I agree. And, and I think like a... Yes, I, I would phrase it a little bit different in a way like um, since people are lazy, you need something that fit with lazy people. Hmm. So in, in everything that you do, um, you have to have, you have to have a, a, a deep understanding on the human uh, psychology so that your solution will exactly fit what's how bad they are. <laughs> it's something that's that's very like it's 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 scary, but that's so true. Like as human, we are imperfect and we have so many flaws and you have to just play with the flaws and not trying to correct them 
Right, definitely. All right, so how did this idea pop up that you would actually ship one product every two weeks for four months? Let's talk about that. So basically my first startup, uh, it was like an in-between, not a success, not a failure. Uh, I managed to, to set it and get decent money, um, but I spent two years on that. So given given how much time I spent on this idea, I'm not, I, really, I consider it more as a failure than a success. And my second startup was even worse, like uh, two years again, and um, total failures. So the idea this time is uh, okay. It's it's normal to have failures, and uh, you have you have to have failures to reach success uh, because you do not know what people want until you give it. Uh, you, you give them. Um, so we need to speed up in shipping products, and we need to have to have one product that works out of ten. We need to ship ten products very fast. So the yeah. idea is uh, let's let's build ten products. Uh, and let's let's ship one every two weeks until something sticks. And um, the definition of sticks was very different from everything we did in the past. Like um, I remember for Pistache, we every, every time we we talked about the app with someone, everyone was saying this is a this is a great idea. I need that for my kids. This is exactly what I need. And the problem is someone telling you this is not someone who is paying. Um, so in, in this case, in this new experiment, um, when we say until something sticks, until a product sticks, we meant until people are actually paying in the app. And that's what we did. Like we started very early in 2021, in January. And I think we released about eight or 10 products before coming to Tweet Hunter. And uh, when we released Tweet Hunter, from the very beginning, people subscribed and stayed and actually used the app uh, on the day-to-day. So we, we just knew that it was the right one. And what was the number? Like, what was the number in Tweet Hunter? So uh, I believe you launched, let's say, eight products. So was Tweet Hunter your first one, eighth one? Uh, it was It was the last. It, it was, was the last it one. Was, it okay. was the last one because after Tweet Hunter, we didn't do another one. Because okay, so Tweet Hunter just blew up. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, and so and I think... Something, something yeah, very important is that when we made these experiments, we didn't do uh, completely different products. Like it, it, we, we try, the idea is that at every new product, we need to be better and uh, stronger and having a competing advantage. And, and what we did for that is that um, we defined before a market, a target, and a, um, a problem to solve. And we said like, we want to target creators and we want to have them making more sales. So by just doing that, at every new product that we shipped, we were collecting email addresses. And um, for the next product, we had a bigger and bigger email base to just send our new product to. So in, in, in this way, like at every new product, we were stronger as a company because the audience we were talking to was a bit uh, bigger. And this was only possible because every time the product was relevant to them because it was the same targets. That is so important. So right now there are two big podcasts on Twitter right now. Number one is My First Million, uh, where Sean is a host. And number two is Where It Happens, where Greg Eisenberg is a host. Uh, Sean used to be part of a design studio and Greg Eisenberg is actually uh, running a design studio. And both have a different ideology. So Sean is like, hey, you should never do a design studio because you are so distracted. Uh, if you are a founder, you are basically, you have to go through that persistence uh, time where like, you know, your product won't be working, but still you have to push through. And that's when you find real growth. What happens in design studio is that the moment you hit that wall, you'll be like, all right, it's time for the next idea. So you never go through the entire cycle of building, like pushing through uh, walls and like, you know, actually, uh, making sure that the product is successful. On the other hand, we have Greg Eisenberg and he's like, hey, we are only focusing on community. Like this is the best way to run a design studio. Focus on a target user, focus on a particular theme and only build products around that because that's when, yes, your target users are the same. So you're not constantly changing people whom you're talking to. You're building a deep relationship with them. You're understanding their problems better and just now searching for different avenues where you can solve their problems. So it's really interesting that you say that because yeah, I also did a design studio and I thought that, okay, let me build different products. And I and I was using Twitter as my biggest channel. So let's say I spend a lot of time, like, you know, writing content on FinTech on Twitter. And the day I stop working on FinTech, if I write, I'm writing about e-commerce, I'm losing all my followers. I, I believe that I'm starting from zero because my tweets are not getting the same number of likes. And it totally made sense that, yeah, you have to focus on a target user. You need to make sure you're only building around them. So I learned that the hard way. Yeah, totally. I, I, 
this is this is exactly the the, the point is you you are identified for doing something and it's super important to to choose correctly uh this topic and to just stay consistent i agree for you yeah definitely so let's talk about tweet hunter why do you think it blew up um so two things i think two two main reasons um the first reason is um so you you, you had at the, at the time a few uh, social media schedulers and twitter scheduler and all of them were focused on one thing scheduling content scheduling okay, it was, yeah. yeah it was giving you uh, automation features a uh, way to better organize your contents but none of them were focused on contents on helping you delivering better contents hmm. and that was the main idea of tweet hunter the main idea is um one id has already been shared a thousand times with different words so basically we would analyze your twitter accounts we would understand what you are trying to share what's your main uh, topics of interest and we'll push you and show you very high performing tweets talking about the same thing because we think that you are very close from going viral it's really just a question of how you phrase your tweets and how you you are just writing them so by showing how on the same topic people are going viral we will help you going viral um at, at uh, by yourself yeah so while i was reading your entire website i believe i came across sweet hunter a couple of months ago and just a few days before that i read this code that everything that had to be said has already been said and everything that had to be done has already been done i'm not sure about the second part of it but the first part i'm definitely sure that everything that has to be said has already been said so what you have to do is just give your own twist to it and that's how twitter works now there are already things that are going viral that okay how to be productive how to uh, be a billionaire and what you have to do just give your own twist add your own punch to it so it's interesting how you are helping them and i'm seeing there's a lot of focus on ai right now uh, definitely i'm thinking this wasn't the case when you actually launched it while you had just had two weeks to launch uh, mvp let's say so what was part of the mvp when you first launched it um at the very beginning we we, we had ai uh, but it was not obvious for users that we 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 had it in the way that it was the ai who really understood what you are talking about and what was the topic that you were talking about and and the ai was also working on like all the tweets and it was the one finding the viral tweets that was talking about the same thing so we had ai but users uh, cannot cannot tell that we had right okay. now so we, we that we extended the usage of ai in a way that if you find something awesome but you want to um rewrite it the ai can, can do it for you uh, so of course it's still it's still like um no what is ai so most of the time it's not perfect and ready to publish and you have to add your own twists to that but it's really helpful for people like me who like I'm 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 a tech guy so writing is not something that I I really uh, I'm I was, I'm great at so just starting with the baseline starting with something it's really helping me to just um tweet every day right yeah just making the job easier uh so I'm curious about that like what was how did tweet hunter look like when it first launched as part of those iterations so <laughs> yeah that's that's interesting because like a tweet hunter as every other tool that we did it was only done in two weeks hmm. so it was super minimal it was just an input field hmm. you uh type something like marketing okay and, and the world of tweets that's right it. that was all an input field and a list of tweets and just by doing that because it it, it lets people find a very high performing and relevant tweets people were paying for that interesting so you were so if i could go on twitter and in the advanced search i wrote marketing and let's say minimum faves or minimum likes more than 500 uh is that the same thing that i would be seeing on tweet hunter like basically scraping no, we, the best tweets from that topic tweet hunter was better and, and still is in a way that <laughs> like twitter is not right. made for it, it's it's really not made for providing you inspiration it it's made for providing you uh, content to consume when when hmm. we do it the, the the ai is trained to find tweets that you can uh way better take something from like take take the id or take the formats okay makes sense and yeah like how did you how did you get the first initial let's say big twitter influencers or i'm not sure if you call them influencers but the big twitter accounts yeah so the very interesting question because i think this is where um twitter tipped 
from from just getting a few subscriptions per, per day or per week to something really big. Um, what I did was basically DMing people, like DMing every people I was following on Twitter, like the, the big accounts that talk about audience growth and uh, how to get money on Twitter, how as a founder you can benefit from Twitter. I just DM them and just uh, suggest uh, asking for them to try the tool and giving me the feedback. But what's super important is I think this can only work if you are legit on Twitter. And by legit, that means uh, not having uh, a two month old account with three followers, uh, having some activity showing that you are active on Twitter and you have a decent mm. number of, of followers and you are getting into conversation publicly right. and privately. And uh, of course, not ed- not everyone answered, but I got some pretty interesting pretty interesting responses, especially from this guy, GK Molina, who reacted very positively to, to Twitter Hunter. He, he basically said, okay, that's exactly as a ghostwriter, what I needed and what I wanted to create. And from, from this day, uh, we worked together a lot in, in, like, um, in how we could uh, find a way to just get him on board. And we found a way. And so basically now he's um, almost like a co-founder and um, he's taking a big um, cut from Twitter Hunter profits and he's managing all the content strategy for us. That is very interesting. Yeah, what's what's super interesting here is that you can find co-founders on Twitter, you can find mm. co-workers, and you can hire people there. It's it's really like you have a way to see not only what people say about themselves, like on LinkedIn, like you, you can say that you have done this or this, but you can really see what they are doing, like what they are mm. shipping, what they are, uh, what what contents they are publishing. So it's when you hire someone from Twitter. You have a way better um, uh, vision of who they truly are. That makes sense. That makes sense, and it's really interesting. So you are building a Twitter growth tool, and you found someone who already has a lot of Twitter followers who is talking about Twitter growth, and now you brought him as your co-founder, and this has boosted your growth even more. Uh, do you still do that, where you cold DM Twitter Twitter accounts that hey, try out Tweet Hunter? Uh, no, I don't. But uh, I, I'm not sure it's a good thing. Like, uh, I okay. mean, maybe I should, I should do it more. <laughs> right. It's like it's really a question of time right now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm the, I'm the tech guy, and we have a very limited uh, team, so I still have a lot to do technically to uh, like add new features, delivering more value, and uh, making every little thing perfect. Definitely, definitely. And yeah, like, how big is your team right now? Um. So on Tweet Hunter, we have a. Uh, two guys helping me on the development and okay. uh, one content writer and that is wow okay and you are so i guess you are sort of the main guy driving the tech yeah exactly you're still coding you're, you're still coding the entire time yeah. every day nice <laughs> every okay. day on the code base trying to help right right i saw there are a ton of features on tweet hunter like what were the initial features that like people found a lot of value like the cool small features that people thought okay this is super valuable so one thing that uh, we added, and I think we were the, the first in the Twitter ecosystem to build it, is these auto DM stuff. It's it's basically a way to say, um, hey, I have this awesome resource that I built. Um, just answer something on my tweets, and we, I will send it to you over DM. And just, just by doing that, a lot of people will answer your tweets because they want this awesome resource. And Twitter will automatically send them um, the, the resource by o- over DMs. And so what's really cool here is that the more people um, answering to your tweets, the more Twitter itself will push your tweets to new people. So by having more engagements, you're having more reach and then more engagement, etc. So this way you can really have a tweet uh, going viral. That makes a lot of sense. Like if you just ask a lot of people to retweet and like your tweet hunter just handles the auto dm stuff that saves a lot of time that gives a lot of growth saves a lot of time so that's 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 a perfect uh combination was there any tweet that you thought like twitter flagged you for like when twitter thought that okay you we are not we do not allow this particular thing no never like uh, when it happened to me it was uh, way before tweet hunter when i was using stuff like uh phantom buster basically when you use these these uh tools like phantom mm. busters it requires you to take the um, um, twitter cookie uh, give give it uh, to phantom buster and then 
Font Ambassador will do things like following and unfollowing people so that you get new followers. And when you do that, okay. th this is forbidden by Twitter. And when you do that, Twitter will detect it because I don't know how, but they are very good at seeing this and they will flag your accounts and you can be banned from, from this. So don't right. do that. Right. I know there are a lot of people on Fiverr right now who are helping with Twitter growth followers. And I once actually tried that. I was like, let me see what they do. And they basically like, you know, started doing the follow and follow thing. And Twitter, Twitter sort of like, you know, flagged my account. And they were like, hey, uh, yeah. just try again. We think your account is uh, hacked. Uh, so I just blocked them. I just blocked the Fiverr guys. I was like, hey, this is not going to work. Let's not do that. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about idea validation now. So you mentioned that you have went through a lot of, you, you have built two startups, spent a lot of time over there. You have built these eight products in very fast sprints. What are your thoughts on idea validation now? I think this is the the advice that as a founder, you don't want to to, to hear basically. And and I I heard this advice a lot uh, when I started as a startupper. And the problem is that you, you think you understand it. And I think in my case, I didn't. Like, uh, people like it's, it's really, I think, I think we were as a founder, I was lying to myself. I really enjoyed at, uh, at a din at a family dinner. I really enjoyed saying that I was a startup CEO and, uh, things were going very well because we raised funds, we hired a big team. Uh, so now we are like 15 in the team, you know, so you feel important when you say this, but the truth is that you are not getting any revenue and. I would, it's, it's almost all fakes because you are just using VC revenue, VC money and hiring a team, which is not getting revenue is really not, uh, something, um, something, something that's uh, worth a lot in the long term. So hmm. basically now I think that's, we have to keep in mind that the number one validation that we should all be looking for is client revenue. Client, some, when someone is paying for something, he's definitely saying that yes, this has value for me and I am getting more from what you are uh, giving me than the money I'm giving you. Definitely, definitely. So you're basically recommending or you're basically advising that instead of going around and asking people that, what do you think about this product? Ask them, will you pay for it? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying pay now. Right. <laughs> not, okay. <laughs> like the, the question, will you pay for it or will you pay for it is really dangerous too, because people do not want to hurt your feelings. Mm. So right. they will, they will mostly say yes, or they will say something like, yes, if you add this feature, I will pay for it. Definitely. And when the time come, there will be another, another reason, like another feature or, or something else. But it's, if something is really valuable to them, they should pay now. Right. Right. I, there was a guy who came on the podcast way back. He's a good friend now. And he basically mentioned that when he was in university and he was testing his ideas, he would just go around to people, say that, Hey, this is my idea. What do you think about it? If you like it, the product isn't ready. So if you like it, can you donate $5? <laughs> so he's literally asking that, Hey, the product isn't ready. You're not going to get anything. So that means I, but I still want to know if you will pay for it. So you're not, not technically paying, you're donating money. So it was interesting. Like he did this, that test and it worked. Yeah, that's, um, that's super smart. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about building, building an audience for founders right now. A lot of founders on Twitter, we see them, they're constantly tweeting. I know this one guy who is a founder of Speechify. I really admire that guy. His name is Cliff Weitzman. And he basically tweets a lot about like, you know, books, how books have changed his life, stuff like that. And what his product is, is basically uh, text to speech. So he's basically like, you know, not selling. Like, I believe this is again, a good advice that I heard. Do not sell saddles, sell horse riding. So if your product is about, let's say, so if your product is text to speech, which means helping people read books, don't sell your text to speech tool, sell reading books. Because when you sell reading books, people will find more value. People will find it more authentic. And when they get into that, when they get into that habit, now they'll be like, okay, what more? And that's when you give them that, okay, take this text-to-speech conversion tool and so that you can read these books faster. You can gain the same knowledge faster. So I thought that was, again, super interesting. But okay, coming back, what do you think is the importance of building audience for founders? Yeah, f first of all, just um, fully agree with what you said. Like, uh, I think we saw a huge conversion rate improvement on our landing page when we change our, um, our motto from about, fr from something about, uh, feature based, um, headlines to something more directed to, Hey, creators, this is just to make you more sales. Hmm. And Twitter is just a way to get you more sales. 
So about about Twitter more specifically, I think as a founder, what the, the value I found here is insane, and I, I really regret not um, not not being serious on Twitter way before. Right. Because in my experience, from the last like uh, one year and a half, um, I found there an easy way to validate IDs, a super easy way to get feedback, um, a way to get IDs. With the, the, as soon as you have Twitter friends or uh, like good relationships on Twitter, it's very easy to identify who is good at what. And when you have an SEO problem, you have like 10 people to DM asking for an advice on SEO. And, and it's the case for any digital topic. It's, it was also a way for Twitter to, to make sales and to find very interesting partnership. Like it's, it's crazy to have CEOs of the best companies in the world uh, being reachable on Twitter. I had a conversation with, um, with this guy, like he, he created ConvertKit. Uh, hmm. don't remember that. Nathan Nathan Berry. Berry. Yeah, yeah. Nathan Berry, he's the CEO of a 20 million AR as a SaaS company. And I just had a conversation over DMs. This is crazy. This can only happen here on, on Twitter. That's true. That's so true. I think that was also again the motivation why I only focus to grow the podcast, I only focus on Twitter. Because Twitter is a place where I can easily with just two DMs, I can have someone on the podcast. There's so much less friction. Uh, on LinkedIn, you have to be like, hey, regards. <laughs> Like, oh, can I, can I send you an email? And then you go from LinkedIn to email, then a lot of email threads to finally booking a call. But I, I feel like Twitter is so good with, with like, you know, growing your products, meeting new people, uh, and yeah, in general, having conversations. So that's super cool. Yeah, I, I agree very much. Like, um, and what, what's, what's really uh, crazy to me is that I, I see more and more companies that um, are getting their clients uh, on, on Twitter in a new way, in just... In, in a way that um, they are now showing their expertise there on Twitter. So instead of doing SEO, um, the, the, the idea is that the, the old way is when you have a problem, like uh, have a, I'm looking for an SEO agency. So I will just look on Google for an SEO agency and I will find some. But um, if, if I knew about a few SEO agencies, when I know that I have the problem, I will not even look on Google for an SEO agency because, and, and, and I will directly reach out to them. So the idea is that if you are known by uh, potential clients, they will not even look for agencies. They will directly go to your solution. So more and more people are building an audience on Twitter and showing their expertise just uh, for in advance for the time where you will need their services. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of brand awareness working behind the scenes where exactly as you mentioned, like if you, let's say, really like Mike Required, if you are uh, reading a lot of tweets from Andrew, then eventually when one day you want to sell your product, sell your uh, company, then you will think about, think about getting Mike Required. So definitely that is working for him a lot. He basically mentions like, you know, how someone uh, who is a follower of him for the last two years, they just build a product because they had the motivation that, okay, even if yeah. I build a good enough product, I can sell it on Mike Required. So these are some really good stories. Yeah. What do you... And, and, and I would, yeah, I would go, go further. Like I've met this company of like th this guy, uh, he's um, Guillaume, he's the CEO of uh, I think a 12 billion they are uh, bootstrapped startup. Okay. And what, what he's doing is even is even better. He's not only him doing the work of uh, talking about his, his SaaS on Twitter and LinkedIn, he's making his entire team doing it and becoming experts on Twitter about their products. This is this is crazy. Look, everyone on his team is like the expert the expert now on Twitter and LinkedIn about about their expertise. So he has like 20 ambassadors talking every day about his products. And I find this brilliant. That's very interesting. So you're basically saying that they are not talking about the product, but they're talking about their expertise. Yeah, exactly. Around the, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think this is something that I also try to motivate uh, my people to do. Like I have a person who is basically doing post-production, uh, who's a producer, and I try to motivate him that, okay, Let's let's try to figure out a way where you can be the best over here, so that and when you also write content around it, so that you not only are serving me in future, maybe you create your own agency where you are now serving podcasters like me, a lot of other podcasters like me, and that's how you can grow your revenue because you could be doing the same thing, but you could be doing the same thing right now for me as an employee, but if you do the same thing as an agency for twelve different people, you, your 
what do we say, money potential, your earning potential just grows 10x or 100x even. So definitely, that's a great strategy. Uh, what is the company? Like, what is the company it's, of... I think it's it's Lemlist. Lemlist, okay. Yeah. Cool. We were actually using Lemlist at my last, at my previous company. This, at least I know the sales team was using it. Right, interesting. So let's talk about marketing now, side project marketing. So <laughs> you build a lot of side projects. You yeah. are doing a lot of marketing. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so... Uh, this is, I think, um, it 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 came from the fact that um, we are not as focused people. <laughs> like <laughs> we we love um, we love starting new products and we love doing very small stuff. And it was awesome to see that from something that we love, uh, we could get more revenue and and we could get more business. So the the idea is that we have this app, Tweet Hunter. And um, is doing great, but it's paid, and there is no way, there is no free tier, no free plan. So you have to to uh, start a subscription to start our products. So we will build a lot of very small products delivering a very small service for very specific needs. One example is uh, a very small app giving you the the perfect time to tweet for your Twitter accounts, given your followers. So we built this like a one page app and it's it's very efficient because it's free uh, it's very easy to use it's um uh, it's seo optimized and it's it's a resource that people feel is very valuable because it's free so it's shared between people hmm. and then when people get in the app and and use it uh it's it's highly likely that um if they need the schedule or if they need a more advanced twitter tool they will then shift to Tweet Hunter. And we have done a lot like this. We have, so this best time to tweet, uh, dot, uh, io. we have an unretweet.com, we have um, uh, a tool to make uh, dynamic banners, with, and we have a few comings. Okay, that's very interesting. Uh, let's talk about money. So how much <laughs> money are you making right now from Tweet Hunter? If you're comfortable sharing, yeah, yeah, definitely, I am. Uh, so we we, sh- we shared, um, I think, a few days ago on Twitter that we just passed the one million RR uh, milestone. So I think right now we just reached like eighty five, eighty five k in uh, monthly recurring revenue. Congrats, man! The, That's crazy. Yeah, thank you very much. It's crazy. But the, what's what's really awesome is um, it's it's still growing. Like it's growing about twenty percent per month, and I think mm-hmm. that's only possible because people are talking about us. Like uh, what's what's super cool is that uh, most of Twitter users they are very happy about the tool and they are really growing. And and since they do, uh, they just mention their growth and they just mention what's the tool behind the growth and it's Twitter. Hunter. There, there was this crazy uh, analysis. I, I don't know if you know this guy. It's it's Dan from uh, ILO Analytics. I know him. Yes. Yeah. So he's he's basically doing um, an analytics focused tool for for Twitter. So you just mm. know the these all the specifics about how your tweets are going. It's really cool. And if you are looking into analytics only, I think it's the best one out there. Um, what he did is he looked at all the tweets that his tool is analyzing, and he just uh, looked at on what scheduler and at what tool uh, they were they have been published. And Tweet Hunter was not the first, basically. Like, okay. I think Tweet Hunter was about eight percent of uh, the total amount, and a lot of other schedulers were in front of were, were before Tweet Hunter. But what was really interesting is that if you look at not the number of tweets. But the engagements generated, Tweet Hunter was the first by far, like very far. So we are not publishing most of the tweets, but I think Tweet Hunter is the number one skill right now if you want engagements. That makes sense. That also shows that uh, it's a more luxury, not luxury, but it's a premium product. Yeah. Because you pay more and you get more audience. Yeah. It's definitely that. Definitely. Uh, who, who, who you thought were your biggest competitors? Um, that's a good question. Like Hyperi is pretty strong, um, uh, but at the same time, like they have no AI feature. It's it's mm. only about scheduling. Typefully is quite good too, but they are also just about they, they are perfect to write threads, but they have no AI features. And uh, we are, I think, way better in automation. Um, and and there are a few others. 
basically, I, I think one of the key things that we do, we do very good is that Tweet Hunter is only about Twitter. And it's hmm. almost the only tool out there who is doing just Twitter. Okay. And it, I think it will, it will stay like this. Uh, we will not integrate new networks because when other schedulers did, they just they they lose they lost their focus, and and that they became sense. better in in scheduling content for all uh, social media. But we just want to be the best for Twitter. And when we started looking at LinkedIn, we did it by launching a new product, which is Taclio. Mm. We didn't want to to make the two networks on one platform because then you are limited by uh, what each platform can do, and it, it leads to a very messy product. And if you look at the the, the SaaS that are letting you handling every networks, they are super messy and very limited in, in features. Interesting. Also, you will have to change your name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it will, exactly. It will no longer be Tweet Hunter. It's only going to be Hunter. Any platform you go, we are the hunters. Uh, yeah. But I'm also curious, what are some cool stories of, let's say, either selling or growth stories for some big accounts that are out there right now who use Tweet Hunter and have grown a lot because of it? Like, not because of it, but there is some good uh, support from Tweet Hunter. Do you know about um, this contest that we did in the, during the winter? During the winter? Yeah. Okay. We, so, so like a, a few a few months ago, we launched the um, we launched a Twitter growth challenge, and um, the the idea is that we were giving away a very small um, part of Twitter to the five people who would grow the most um, in in the challenge. And I love this idea because everyone, even the were even the people that who are not winning, they win something for themselves because they mm. just they grew. So even if you are not the, in the top five, you have worked for yourself. You have you have worked on your audience. I love What's that. What's crazy? Yeah. What's, what's yeah. crazy is that the top five, uh, they grew like crazy. Like they, I think they went from five k followers to fifty k in just three months, and that was that was insane. And it, it showed how how valuable their content was. And who are these five? Like, is there anyone who we would know? Yeah, so obviously, um, if they're 50k, we would know. Uh, e Eslo is is one of them. Um, there was this guy also, uh, Mindset. I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, yeah, but basically, I, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, Mindset Machine, uh, Dakota. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that's helpful, but they are very, very successful guys on Twitter. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, and when you said you would give them a small portion of Tweet Hunter, what does that mean? Yeah. Are you giving them equity of Tweet Hunter? Sort of, yeah. So Tweet Hunter is not a company; it's a product in a company. So okay. um, there is no like equity for Tweet Hunter. But we, we did something similar where like, they they have um, they have a right on profits and uh, a right on the acquisition if it happens. So it's it's wow. basically as if they were they had shares. Okay, that's really interesting. And which is which is awesome because now that they have huge accounts um, with with equity, they are helping us talking about Tweet Hunter, uh, so it's like it's even uh, better for us. I love that, like because I'm always thinking about these like you know different growth strategies. I used to consult in growth, and this was the plan. I I would just throw random stuff out there, and some things would go viral, some things would not, and this this is one of them. Like even for podcasts, I believe what I did was just shoot out a message that hey whoever creates a reel a tiktok a short that goes viral with the podcast content uh will give them a certain amount of money and that sort of like you know picked up a lot of people made content around that so i always i always love these sort of small contests and i think that's a winner that's a winner for you thanks thanks man yeah uh all right what else let's talk about Taplio. uh so when did you think that all right you need to you have crushed the twitter twitter algorithm now it's time to go on linkedin yeah, so T Tapio is this is exactly exactly this. Like we are trying to do on LinkedIn what we did on on Twitter, but LinkedIn is so much harder to work with. It's crazy. Okay. <laughs> like the, their API, their ecosystem, and uh, and uh, yeah, everything. But they have more users. They have yeah. users with um, very very high potential, and right. uh, we it's very easy to get email addresses on LinkedIn. Um, so what, what we did is basically we made a copy of Tweet Hunter to, to create Tapio, 
we changed the backend, uh, we changed some of the features, we added some other features dedicated to LinkedIn, and we released that like uh, about uh, three weeks ago. We released Tapio, and I think we just reached fourteen thousand uh, in monthly recurring revenue, which is That's which great. is quite good. Like it's not it's not crazy, but it's going mm-hmm. faster than Twitter when it started. So Definitely, I'm, yeah. I'm I'm very happy about how it's going, and uh, like I, I hope that it's it will it will keep growing. Right. So people who already have a tweet hunter subscription, do they get some sort of discount for Taflio? Uh, we're working on that. <laughs> I, w- I would love to find It's like everything we are trying to do, we try uh, to make it uh, automatic. Like for, mm. for example, we have this 30 days refund policy for tweet hunter. And mm. na- now to get, to get the refund, you have a button for that. Like you can just press a button and you get the refund. And almost no one is doing this. On, on absolutely, yeah. uh, but it's like for us, it's super important because we first of all, it's it's fair, and mm. it's like it helps us running a big SaaS with a very limited tweet, a very limited team. I think the number one thing that does is it builds trust. Like yeah, when you have a true. refund button, I never saw that. I still remember. Um, I believe when I was working at my previous startup, I had to give a presentation for the presentation. Uh, we were pitching to some investors and uh, I be- I thought that we had a video editor who can help me out with it. But the video editor was sick. He couldn't do it. So I had to do my own video editing and I had never done it. So I actually went and bought like just search for video editing software. And obviously there are ton. I just straight away paid money to one of them and it wasn't working properly. It was so bad. And when I started like, you know, uh, looking for that refund button, it wasn't there. And now I thought that was the worst experience I ever had because I had to email them twice or thrice so that they don't keep on charging my credit card. And then I found a better software on Product Hunt, which simply had a refund button. So I thought that was really good. Like that builds a lot of trust. So now if I want to go back again, I will go to that Product Hunt tool because yeah, even though even though I'm not like a big whale customer for them, but they have built some trust for me that I will keep going back to them. So I, th- I think that's very important. Yeah, what you want is like customers on the long term. You don't want people just coming and, and leaving mm-hmm. and just re- refunding them is not a big loss. So yeah. Exactly. And also if you do something bad like this, you will, you're going to get a lot of Twitter, uh, tw- uh, Twitter. what do we say? A lot of Twitter uh, aggression. A lot of people yeah. are going to tweet against you that this customer support sucks. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And those tweets go viral a lot. Uh, but yeah, for Taplio, what you definitely mentioned that, yes, number one, there are people with, there are users with more earning potential. There are way more users. Uh, there could be, let's say, three times or four times more than Twitter. Twitter definitely has a lot of bots right now. Uh, what what other things have you found on LinkedIn? Like what other cool insights have you found on LinkedIn? Um but it's something that I, I didn't think of when I started this this like uh, project is that on LinkedIn you have teams. Like mm. on, on Twitter you have solo planners, but on, on LinkedIn you have teams. And um we had this this client who just he purchased fifteen licenses of Tapio okay. for for like fifteen uh, 15 times the price of, of one uh, account. So it can go way faster because a big team are just uh, taking licenses for everyone in their company. Hmm. Right. Is the pricing different for LinkedIn and a Twitter? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So for right, right now, it's a bit cheaper on Tapio for LinkedIn uh, because we are, we are pricing per seat. Which is not mm. the case on on Twitter. On Twitter, you can connect as much Twitter accounts as you want on Tweet Hunter. On LinkedIn, you can connect only one tweet, only one uh, LinkedIn account. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I, I believe just because of the fact that now people are using for more value and to create even more expensive leads, maybe on LinkedIn, you could potentially charge even higher on LinkedIn uh, because now teams are hiring and you can have a totally different yeah. pricing for teams. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and how different? Like, what are these users? Who are these users who are using uh, Taplio right now? I'm just curious. Um, I think it's a mix of um, coaches, CEOs, mm. um, consistency people. Yeah, a mix of that. Okay, makes but, sense. Yeah, you, are, you are very right. Like, they have a more, it seems like they have a more, more purchasing power, which is mm. interesting to work with. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, like, are you planning of moving to different platforms like Instagram? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> like LinkedIn is a bit like, uh, like Twitter, it's text based, uh, hmm. Instagram, uh, TikTok, it's going to be a huge work 
to just make it uh, make it better handling the videos and the images. Huge work yeah. in front of us. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we'll see you. Instagram hunter, but Ingo, <laughs> this was good. This was good. This was a really fun, free flowing conversation and enjoyed it. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Me too. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it was, it was really, it was lovely talking to you. Uh, and, uh, I would be, I would just, I would just end this by saying that, uh, my DMS are completely open. So if anyone wants to reach out and just talking about tweet hunter W or anything else, uh, feel free to do so. Perfect.